Welcome, and thanks for listening to this message from Nebo Crossing. For more information about our church, please visit nebocrossing.com. Let's join Pastor Les. Well, let's go to the book of James, chapter 3. I struggled yesterday and the day before. I really wanted to do something on fathers tonight. And uh, just everything I touched went cold on me. So this is where the Lord landed with me. And about last February, I did a, a, a two series messages over in the, the Bible study hour at 10 o'clock. And I did it on this topic. And this is where the Lord wanted me to go again tonight. And I think it's probably because it goes along a lot with the Drudge Report. And tonight I want to, uh, you can put that first screen up there, John. I want to touch this topic, how to manage your mouth. Anybody got a mouth problem? Got a bunch of liars. <laughs> Everybody's got a mouth problem. I think if I, if I look past the four, last 40 years of my life, and if I look in ministry, and if I look at problems in marriages, and problems in church, and problems at work, and problems everywhere I've, I've been, I think the, the, the glaring thing that sticks out is what we say with our mouth. Would you not, not all agree with me on that? We just have so much problems. And I think it's because we do it all the time. We talk all the time. And when we talk all the time, we have a tendency to say the wrong things. And sometimes it gets us in trouble. Sometimes it cuts deep. Sometimes it affects a lot of things. Now, this message is not a typical... Um, tongues, speech, message. This message actually is going to help you see yourself. Actually, it's, it's, it's to help you with your theology. I was talking to Pastor Bob the other day, and uh, we have emotions. I know we have emotions. Uh, it's good to have, to hear a great emotional message that gets you all stirred up. Uh, I like some of those. I need those. But the things that are the thing that'll really hold you is when your theology is changed. When your theology is changed, what you think and believe about this book, it will hold you to a conviction. And so, actually, we need both. We need the emotion. We need to be encouraged because we get discouraged. I've, I've some of the reading I've been doing recently. I've, I, I told you in the last message I preached that I found out that. Um, I get depressed easy, and I, I'm, I'm one of those guys that, that, re, that kind of introverts, and, and um, uh, I want to be by myself, and maybe that's why I want to go to the shop and beat on a car with a hammer and just everybody leave me alone, because I, I have a tendency to do that. We all have our downsides. This is one of those things that touches all of us. For the most part, all the messages that I've heard on this topic, so many times, God's people don't listen. They won't apply. I hope I can help you tonight. I'm going to try to, 30 minutes, give me 30 minutes, turn on that brain for 30 minutes, and I'm going to give you a three-point outline that can really help you manage your mouth. And not only that, it'll help you understand the whys. Boy, Pastor Bob's been doing a series in, for all the adults in the Sunday School Hour on spiritual warfare. If you do not come to Sunday School, not normally, I would invite you. He's in, I think today was session four, and it is an awesome study. It will answer so many questions for you about why, why you are like, why, the reason you are, the reason you do, the reason you think it's in this, it's in the, under this category of spiritual warfare. This topic really goes along with the Drudge Report. I think so many Christians are not in church tonight because somebody's hurt them. And many times, it's because of what somebody has said. Let's look at James chapter 3. I'm going to be there for the entire evening in James chapter 3, but I want to just read one kickoff verse so that we can kind of get focused here. Those of you that were in my class last February, you probably need the review. Um, we actually need to hear this about once a month. Um, and so it's been like five or six months since I taught this. So you need the review. So excuse me if... If uh, you, you were going to get something totally neat tonight, but this is where the Lord wanted me to, to speak tonight. Let's look at James chapter 3. You read silently. I'm going to read loud. I'm going to read one verse for a kickoff verse. 
verse number 2. James chapter 3, verse number 2. For in many things we offend all. Boy, that's so true. And he goes on to say, If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man. That means mankind. So me a lady also. The same is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. Now get this promise. If you can manage your mouth, you can bridle everything else in your life. That is a wonderful promise. It's a tall order. But if you can manage your mouth, you can bridle everything. I love that promise. We love to talk. I found out through some stats that we average 30 conversations a day. Of those 30 conversations, you will spend about one-fifth of your life talking. Now, some of you have already got your one-fifth in. You need to slow down probably a little bit. And according to these stats I read, the average person in one year could fill 66 books with 800 pages. That's a whole lot of talking. That's incredible. Some of us are born, you've heard the term, with a silver spoon in our mouth. Well, some of us are born with a silver foot in our mouth. We just have this natural ability to say the wrong things at the wrong time. And I've been around some of those people. It's just like, it's just like they are always out of time with everything. Makes me want to be quiet, personally. Our mouths get us into a lot of trouble. Tonight I want to give you three key ingredients here that James gives us. This helped me so much when I looked at this and studied it. It's, it's kind of a different outline than, than I've ever really studied or really taught. But it'll help us. This word perfect, by the way, and James says, if you can control your mouth, if you can manage your mouth, you're going to be perfect. That really doesn't mean sinless perfection. It simply means healthy, mature. I like the idea of being healthy and mature. James says, if you can manage your mouth, you can be healthy. When I go to the VA hospital, when I do anything medical, many times when I go in there, Dr. Acri, he'll want me to open my mouth and look at my tongue. And... I've always wondered why they do that. Well, evidently, your physiology, a lot about your physiology can be determined by looking at your tongue. I think James in this passage of Scripture is saying, we want to look at your tongue, not for your physiology, but for your spiritual condition. I think your mouth is a reflection of your spiritual condition. And that's what James is saying here. Words are so significant. And so James gives us Three things. Little Peyton, I just, I got tickled today. Tanya told me a little story. Peyton goes home with Keith Owensby a lot. And they're buds, they're best buds. And I don't know if it was today or another time, but Tammy asked Peyton, well, now who do you like the most, Keith or your parents? And he just looked at his mom and said, man, that's a tough decision. <laughs> Peyton says the funniest thing sometimes. We as adults got to watch what we say. Anybody, did, have you, did you say anything in, a, say, the last month that you wish you hadn't said? Anybody like that? In the last month, that pretty much takes in about all of us. Why do we do that? I've, I've, been, I've been focusing and concentrating on this for so long. I think it's because when I was a child, my dad was a strict disciplinarian. And he always told me, sit down and be quiet. When we go to somebody's house, he'd say, sit down and be quiet. And that's what I did. I, I didn't talk. And then I got saved. I was taught to stand up and speak out. Well, I've been sitting down and being quiet all my life. So now I'm supposed to stand up and speak out. And it's so against, it's so against my nature. And then when I read passages like this, that you need to guard your lips and manage your mouth and be careful. And even Jesus said that we will answer at the, at the Bema seat, we will answer for every word spoken. 
Is that scary to you? That's, that's scary to me. We're going to answer for every word that we've ever spoken. That's, that's just really serious. That's just really kind of frightening to me. It makes me not want to talk. Let's get to the outline. Here we go. This is so important. I want you to, I want you to, you missed the introduction there part, John. Uh, let's go to the first one. My tongue directs where I go. My tongue directs where I go. This is so crucial. It has a tremendous effect, influence, and control over your life. And James is trying to tell us here, where are you headed in life? Where are you headed? And where are you going to be 10 years from now? Especially you, you youngsters. I would encourage you to look at your conversation. You maybe have never heard this before. James is teaching here that our tongue actually directs where we go. We shape our words, and then our words shape us. James says the tongue is so small and tiny, and we think it's insignificant, but it has tremendous power. And he uses an illustration here about the horse. You take a, we just had the Kentucky Derby here recently. Take a two or three thousand pound animal, put a 95 pound jockey on him, and he has this little piece of metal stuck strategically over his tongue. And that jockey controls that animal. Likewise, our tongue controls the direction that we go in life. We could maybe even call that self-talk. I'm not, there's another whole lesson on that. But how you talk directly influences where you're going. And then he uses another example here in the first few verses of this passage. He says, consider a ship. The Queen Mary, did you know the Queen Mary has three acres of recreational space on its deck? That's pretty incredible. I've seen some pretty big ships in the military, but thats I just never thought of it that way. The anchor of the Queen Mary equals the weight of about 10 cars. And yet the helmsman controls this large ship with a very small rudder. It controls the direction it's going. Our tongue is like that. Our tongue actually is a rudder that steers us. Actually, your tongue is the steering wheel of your life. I think about all the times sitting in the office through the years, talking with maybe a teenager or usually young couples. And the way they talked to one another, the way they talked about their life, was an indicator to me of where they were going. I hope you know where you're going. Your speech, if you don't like where you're going, maybe you need to change your conversation. Your conversation has a direct effect on where you're going. This guy joined the monastery. He wanted to be spiritual. And they told him when they got there, you're going to be on probation for three years. And you can't speak. At the end of each year, you get to say two words. All right? So he was so diligent. At the end of the first year, he said, Here, what's your two words? He said, bed, hard. So he worked another whole year. Two years down the road. Hasn't spoken. You know, the average guy speaks 20,000 words a day. This guy hadn't said any words. At the end of two years. He gets down to the last, last day of two years. The priest says, what's your two words? Food, cold. Some of you are not even smiling. Come on, guys. He goes another year, and this time he's just really getting pretty tight. He hasn't sent any words. He's almost got three years in. He gets to the last of the three years. Priest says two words. I quit. The high priest said, doesn't surprise me. All you've done is complain since you've been here. <laughs> Our words affect our direction. Think about what you talk about. Think about what you talk to your friends when you're away from the church. What do you talk about? Where are you going? James is giving us some big warnings here. Your tongue controls your direction. 
Number two, my tongue can destroy what I have. My tongue can destroy what I have. I hope when we leave tonight, this is not just another message on our tongue. I've, I've come to the conclusion, I've been in quite a few churches through my military life, through college life, and, and this problem is everywhere. You know, the sitcoms teach us to turn our brain and our tongue kind of loose and just let it free fall. The sitcoms teach us that. And I hear a lot of conversation that I think is not pleasing to the Lord. All you got to do is go to Walmart and walk down the house. And I hear a lot of conversation I think is not pleasing to the Lord. But for Christians, it should be different. For, Christian, we should, for Christians, we should be managing what we say because words are so powerful. And the average Christian don't even think about it. The average, Christians, the average Christian is influenced by our environment, by all the media. And so many times... Just to get a laugh, we, we turn our mouth loose, we disengage our brain, and then we say something that we shouldn't have said. I think we're going to answer for it. The Bible's clear. We're going to answer for every word. I, think, I don't think we need to be a bunch of deadheads. Hey, I like to have fun. When all my kids come home and all the girls and all their kids, we have a blast. But I still think it can be in Jesus' name, don't you? I think it can be. Number two, my tongue can destroy what I have. James gives us an illustration in verse five here. I didn't take time to read all 12 verses, but he talks about fire. Boy, fire is so, is so destructive, or at least it can be. In Australia in 1983, a gentleman struck a match, and before it was all over, 600 miles of land and villages and livestock were all destroyed from that one single match. And James is trying to paint a picture here you can lose it all with this tongue that God has given you if you use it wrong. Gossip is like fire. It can destroy a life overnight. And over time, it can actually destroy thousands of lives. It spreads quickly and it wrecks havoc. So many people, because of careless words, have destroyed their marriages. They've destroyed their careers destroyed their reputation or somebody else's. They've hurt their church. They've fragmented a friendship or just sowed a lot of seeds of discontent. The tongue not only has power to direct, but it can destroy if we don't manage it. I have a word up on the screen. I like this word. It, it, it really speaks to me. A verbal arsonist. Are you a verbal arsonist? A little fire. If you start a little fire with that tongue of yours, you can do a lot of burning. You can, you can hurt people, especially when, you, when you've become a Christian and you're supposed to be responsible for what you say, and yet you have this philosophy of just winging it all the time and just letting your mouth fly and disengaging your brain and you say things, or, you're, or at least you have the potential to say things that really hurt people or scar them. Bob even mentioned this morning something about um, somebody you counsel that is having a hard time with one or two words from their childhood. How is that even possible? That's the power of words. And we take it so, we're just so flippant about it. I know I am. I have to remind myself this all the time. Because I, I, I picture myself... I, I'm, a, I'm a picture guy. I picture myself at the judgment seat of Christ, looking at Jesus eyeball to eyeball and giving an answer for my words. It's kind of frightening. He doesn't, I don't think he intends it to be frightening. But he gives us warnings here in the scripture, and James is so good at it. Years ago in the 1970s, I guess, they used to have this show called The Dean Martin's Celebrity Roast. Anybody remember that show? Anybody old enough to remember that show besides me? Not one hand in here. At any rate, and the purpose of this show was to get some star on there, and then you get this other panel, and they would just burn this person with their words. Just burn him up. Just say things that were hateful and ugly and digs and all this stuff. And I thought, that's terrible. It's teaching America to do the same thing. And Christians do the same thing sometimes. And I know we like to have fun, and I know there's a fine line between where fun's stops and where hurt starts. 
And only the Holy Spirit can really show you where that line is. And we've got some real kidders in here. There's some real pranksters that go to Nemo Crossing. And, and I understand. And that's okay. I like to have fun. But I think I'd probably, I'd probably fall on the side of moderate safe. I, I probably do. Now, I'm, I was a prankster when I was a kid. Um, I was a real prankster when I was a kid. Um, but not anymore. And because, and it's, why is it? It's because of my theology. See, your theology holds you. It'll change you. It'll make you stop and give up some things and start doing some things that you haven't started doing. Emotion will fail you. If you just get all stirred up emotionally, man, 24 hours later, it's probably gone. But if you get your theology changed, that's what James is trying to do here. He's trying to help you see yourself. Fire and words under control can be a tremendous warmth and light. But fire and words out of control are absolutely devastating. Proverbs 18.30. I don't think I've used any of the scripture yet. Proverbs 18.30. Well, this is a really good verse. I had to read it several times. A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth. And with the increase of his lips shall he be filled. Let me read that verse again and think, try to think about what it's saying. A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth. And with the increase of his lips shall he be filled. That verse is actually saying you have to live with the consequences of everything you say. Look at the verse. You have to live with the consequences of everything you say. James is trying to teach so many things here. In verse 6, it talks about um, the world of iniquity. It is set on fire of hell. Um, he is saying here that words can create a chain reaction. I found another term this week. How many has heard the term rolling story? Anybody? I've never heard that term. A rolling story is when I have a story and I go down here and tell Jeff. And Jeff tells Jen. And then Jen tells my wife. And my wife tells Tanya. Tanya goes back here and tells uh, Miss Tammy. A rolling story is every time you tell a story, you add something and you take away something. That's called gossip. It's a rolling story. And by the time it touches 10 or 15 people, there basically isn't any assimilation of truth in it at all. It's just a story. James says, when you have a rolling story, it's like gossip. It's destructive. On a more personal level, I read this little story. This man came home, he's tired and he's grumpy and he's cranky. We call it cratchety at my house. He comes home and yells at the wife. The wife yells at the oldest kid. The oldest kid yells at the babysitter. The babysitter goes out and kicks the dog. The dog goes and bites the cat. The cat comes in and scratches the baby. The baby bites the head off the Barbie doll. Wouldn't it have been a whole lot easier if dad would just come in and bit the head off the baby doll? Come on, guys. That's supposed to be funny right there. <laughs> That's called a rolling story. Just everything gets all out of perspective because dad came in all cratchety. And he said something to the wife. How many times? How many times do we have to learn this? How many times do we let our emotions affect our mouth? How many times? It's over and over and over again. And you kick yourself over and over and over again. James says you need to learn how to manage your mouth. The words here, set on fire of hell, it's kind of an interesting phrase. It actually kind of means when all hell breaks loose. I can think back in my, some of my Kentucky days when I had some couples in my office try to help them through some difficult times. And one would say something to the mate that was ugly. Well, then the other mate would say something to that mate that was ugly. And before long, all hell broke loose in that office. 
It's because of tongues and mouths out of control. We're all guilty. Aren't you glad that stuff can go under the blood? Yeah, I am. I am glad. But that's got to stop. James also says, he is an illustration here. He talks about animals. He talks about all kinds of animals that have been tamed, but no man can tame the tongue. It's humanly impossible. Only God can do this. He says it's restless. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison there in verse 7 and 8. Of all the animals that we've tamed, no man can tame the tongue, humanly speaking. And that word unruly evil, that's an interesting word. In uh, California, they have a place called um, the Lion Country Safari. And when they opened that safari, they had signs up, do not get out of your car, do not roll down the window, do not fraternize or feed the animals. And why? Because the animals, even though they appear to be tame, at any moment, they could literally rip your head off, especially if it's a lion, a tiger, or a bear. Well, James is using this word, unruly evil, to talk about our tongues. I've been in a situation and it was all peaceful. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, it got like a lion was in the room. Just that quick. James calls that an unruly evil. Un How does that happen? I don't know. I wish I had that answer. I guess it's just sin. But it destroys. He also uses a word like poison. Um, venom, snake venom, he's talking about. Just a few drops can kill you. And this fire that's on our tongue can destroy us so quickly, assassinate our character, or kill us completely. When I went to Thailand in 1971, during the Vietnam conflict, first thing they told us when we got off the plane, stay off the grass, stay on the blacktop, or on the concrete, and stay out of the grass. And they said, no, no, we mean what we say. There's a snake here, we call it a seven-stepper. If it bites you in seven steps, you're on the ground. And if you don't get the antidote in 20 minutes, you're dead. Hey, I stayed out of the grass. <laughs> I stayed on the blacktop. And uh, I think James is trying to warn us here. Words that are fire and venom, they can kill us. Our tongue can direct where we go and our tongue can destroy what we have. Number three, my tongue displays who I am. Of the three, this is the most important one. Of the three, this is the most important one. I realize I'm probably maybe hitting a lot of areas that you are already very aware of. But please get this and please practice these three things. And we're going to, get, we're going to end up with the, uh, the antidote to all of this uh, and another little bit of outline. But my tongue displays who I am. It reveals my real character. It tells me what's really inside of me. James points this out in verse 9. Let me look at verse 9 here. I'm in chapter 1, or chapter 3, I'm sorry. And in verse 9, let me get there. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. James gives an illustration here uh, later on in the chapter, and he talks about water. He talks about um, trees and fruit. How can we have such a contradiction that comes out of our mouth? We come into church on Sunday. The highest use of our mouth is to sing the praises that Glenn um, led us in tonight. By the way, he did a great job, Glenn. Um, and then we can walk right out, church on Sunday, and before we leave the parking lot, be in a fight with our wife in the car over, over maybe where we're going to eat. Some of you are kind of giggling right now. How, how, is that, how does that happen? How can we be praising the Lord in here and really uh, worshiping Him and, and thanking Him for saving us and all the blessings of life? Pastor Bob gets up and preaches a great message, a great message this morning. We we'll go get in our cars, and before we exit the parking lot, we're 
fussing and fighting over maybe what we're going to eat. Isn't that incredible? Can you, can you picture Jesus doing that? Boy, I can't. My tongue displays who I am. We are a contradiction sometimes. It is so inconsistent. It's amazing how quickly we can change. We have a Dr. Jekyll and a Mr. Hyde tongue. One minute we're praising, and the next minute the Bible even says we're cursing. That word doesn't mean uh, using swear words. It could include that, but it means talking down to people, um, cursing men, saying bad things to them. You're good for nothing, or you never amount to nothing, or you're just like your whatever you can put in there. Talking down. This should bother us immensely. How is this even possible? And yet I know I'm guilty myself. I mean, I know I love God. I remember when I got saved. I know I want to please him and serve him. I know I want to end well. And yet this mouth that I have sometimes is so opposite of what I want. Sometimes we hurt our family more than we hurt anybody. Here's the testimony of this church. I, I visit quite a few of the visitors that visit, and I go to visit them, and here's the, here's the common theme that they all say. Man, I really felt welcome there. Your church is so friendly. I mean, I just, I'm coming back. Now, they may never join, but they came back. They said, I just really, it was just awesome. I just really enjoyed that. That's because you're being so kind. But here's the problem. Now, that's good. We need, to, we need to step that up a notch. But what about your family? What about those people you live with? What about those people you're always around? You've got to be careful there. Satan will get in there, and before long, um, sweet water and bitter water is coming out of your mouth. And that's not supposed to be. Why do we do that? Well, James tells us. He says it's a source problem. He gives us two examples. He said, can you go find a fountain that's going to give you salt water and fresh water? No, you can't find one. You can't. Can you find an olive tree that's going to give you cherries or a cherry tree that's going to give you olives? No, you can't find one. They only give you one thing. Whatever the source is, that's what they give you, but not our tongue. Sometimes our tongue is going to give sweet water and sometimes it gives bitter water. Why is that? Well, James says... Consider the source. You ever heard this excuse? Well, I've heard this so many times from Christians. Someone says something really mean or hurtful, and they say, I don't know what got into me. It's not like me to say that. I don't know why I said that. It's totally out of my character. I really didn't mean it. Do you know what James, the apostle, would say to them? He'd say, oh, yes, you do mean it, because it's a reflection of your source. Ouch. Ouch. But it's so true. Quit kidding yourselves. What's inside is going to come out. Now, if you honestly will look at this point, when you're managing your mouth, it actually is a reflection of who you are. That's scary. Because I don't like some things that have come out of my mouth before. But he's saying it's a reflection or a picture of your heart. Matthew 12, 34. O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Let me give you these. This is a list that's actually another lesson. But let me give you this list. Some of you are going to maybe, maybe want to write this down. This is, this is deep theologically, okay? Uh, there's a lot here, but I'm just, going to give you, I'm just going to give you the lines, and John's going, to, John's going to peel them back one at a time. If you have a harsh tongue, your source is an angry heart. If you have a negative tongue, now I want you to think about these. Are you one of those negative people? If you have a negative tongue, your source is a fearful heart. If you have an overactive tongue, your source is an unsettled heart. Now, these are deep, aren't There's a, You can say so much here and you can do so much studying. If you have a boasting tongue, I've met some of those. You have a, you have, let me look at my, 
an insecure heart. Your source is an insecure heart. This is a pretty easy one. If you have a filthy tongue, you have an impure heart. Boy, I met some of those in the military. My goodness. If you have a critical tongue, got some of those at Nebo Crossing. I'm not thinking of anyone in particular person. Just I, listen, I just live here, okay? <laughs> if you've got a critical tongue, your source is a bitter heart. A bitter heart. I don't know about you, this, this preaches to me. This is so, this is so theological. And let's swing the pendulum the other way. If you have an encouraging tongue, it's because your source is a happy heart. If you have a gentle tongue, it's because your source is a loving heart. And if you have a truthful tongue, it's because you have an honest heart. I'm just telling you, that's a, that's a whole lot to chew right there. But I, I want to get you out here fast tonight. I just, I just want you to think about those. I want you to maybe write them down or uh, you, can, you can go on the app and hear them again whenever they post this message. And you can get those and you can write them down. And you can ask the Holy Spirit, where do, where do I fall there? Do I, have a, do I have a harsh tongue? Do I have a negative tongue? How about overactive tongue? Or a boasting tongue? God forbid, a filthy tongue. Critical tongue. I hope you fall in this last group, an encouraging tongue or a gentle tongue or a truthful tongue. There's so much right there. I hope you'll take it to heart. I've given you three. That's all I have. That's all I want to give you. My tongue directs where I go. My tongue can destroy all I have. And my tongue displays who I am. And it does. Each one of these could be a message in itself if you're really one to dig and, and uh, get a lot of harmonizing with all the scripture. Let me give you a solution. So Brother Green, you're, just, you're killing me. Um, all this stuff, I mean, I know I say bad things. I know I say wrong things. I know I have wrong motives. I know I uh, say inappropriate things. Um, uh, and boy, sometimes the Lord convicts me of something I might say and I just have to go get it right. Um, What's the solution? Let me give you three things, okay? Now, we know it's not easy. The Bible says no man has tamed his tongue. But through God's Spirit, we can. And the Bible also gives us that promise. If we'll manage our mouth, we can bridle anything in our life. That's, that's awesome. Number one, what's the solution? Get a new heart. Get a new heart. Ezekiel 18.31 Cast away from you all your transgressions whereby ye have transgressed and make you a new heart and a new spirit for why will ye die, O house of Israel? What is a new heart? Well, a new heart is 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Maybe you just need a new heart. I used to be real, um, I guess, apprehensive about saying anything about salvation to a Sunday night crowd. And I realized we got a lot of people out today because of Father's Day. But you know, the Bible is clear about not being able to tell the wheat from the tares. I, I really can't tell who's saved just by... I mean, I can take your testimony, but there may be somebody here tonight, really, you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. You just, you really, I mean, you like going to church, you like being around God's people, but if you were to get alone in a room with God, how, would you, how do you answer that question? Yeah, I know I'm going to heaven. How do you know that? Do you know for sure that you've put your trust in the blood work of Christ on Calvary for your salvation? If you haven't, that's why you have so much trouble with your mouth. Because you can't even begin to manage your mouth 
without getting a new heart because you have a corrupted source. When you get saved, you get a new source. It still doesn't go away. We still have the sin nature, but you get a new source. And James tells us that we need to get a new source. I like the verse in Psalm 51, creating me a clean heart, O God. Boy, that's just, that's such a refreshing scripture. Number two, not only do you need to get a new heart. Now, this is for Christians. Number two is for people that are already saved. Ask God for help every day. Ask God for help every day. You need supernatural power to manage that mouth of yours. We do. We need supernatural power. I've, I've watched some people so out of control. I remember one guy at work. He was my boss at work when I was in college. He was a wild man. I mean, that guy. I mean, you could just tell. When you just got around him, he walked real fast. He stomped his heels. He was biting his jaw all the time. His face was red. And everything that came out of his mouth was expletives and just ripping, just tearing. Oh, just, I mean, that guy, I just wanted to shoot him. <laughs> I mean, I'm thinking, how sad this is. This man has no clue of what peace and tranquility is. We need to ask God to help us manage our mouth. I know, it can sneak up on you. You can be like one of those tame lions, and all of a sudden, it starts at your feet, you know. Somebody stroked you the wrong way, and it starts, and it comes up here. And you can just feel it filling you up. And, it, and then it gets here. I mean, you know, if you haven't got a way to manage your mouth, you're just going to say stuff you'll regret sometimes for a long time. Psalm 141.3 Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. That would be a good verse to memorize and quote it every morning before you launch. Because you don't know how you're going to be tested tomorrow. And you men that work in the public sector, uh, if you don't work for a Christian, if you're working just for some company, then not necessarily Christian. You may have Christians there, but uh, boy, you need, to, you need to quote that in the morning. When I was in the military, I'm telling you, I had to keep my distance because um, I was a Christian in the military. I mean, I love the Lord in the military. I witnessed to a lot of guys, and some of them literally hated me and would cuss and just carry on and act like, just act like animals out of control. And I just I understood. I, I could see why they just needed a new heart. But we need to be careful. We need to ask God every day. Grow 201. We have the new class starting. How to get a grip on your Bible. Part of this, asking God to help you every day. Listen, do more than just pray and ask God to help you. You need to read your Bible. You need to get a firm grip on your Bible and get your theology changed so that you can think right. And that thinking right will help you be right and do right and think right and speak right. Number three, get a new heart. Ask God for help every day. Number three, think before you speak. How many times have I heard that? And yet we don't do it. Do we do that? Think before you speak. I hope you're doing that. So many in, in the emotional moment, usually it's anger, will just let her rip and things come out of your mouth that shouldn't be coming out there. James gives us a formula in verse 19. He says, slow to speak and slow to wrath. Slow to speak, slow to wrath. If you're quick to listen and slow to speak, you'll be slow to wrath. That's the formula. Do the first one. Be quick to listen. There's a real gift if you're a good listener. It's a real gift. Just listen. Just be patient and listen. And then be slow to speak. And when you do those two, you'll be slow to wrath. That's the formula. It's a formula that he gives us here. It's a designation. They go in order. Do those in order. And you will be greatly helped in what you say. Let me, let me just give some final comments here. For many of you, maybe this was just a mundane lesson. I know that. I know that. I want to do something on fathers tonight. But this is where we live. If Nebo Crossing Church is going to be this kind, community-oriented, love people like Jesus loves, we're going to have to get this principle because it starts in your mouth. Listen, you can't fool your kids and you can't fool visitors. 
would have to be the real deal. And I'm glad we have the testimony of being kind and loving people. Man, I, I want that to grow. And, of course, Bob has perpetuated that, and he's helped us with that. Now, I'm, and I'm glad. Um, but we've got, to get, we've got to get this managing our mouth down, especially between one another. Especially when you go home to your wife, men, and when your husband does come home, wives, how do you speak to him? How do you speak to your children? How are we speaking to one another as brothers and sisters in Christ? I think God is getting, getting us ready for explosive growth. I really believe that. I believe he wants us to reach this community before Jesus comes. And I believe Jesus could come even tomorrow, don't you? Are we ready? Are we getting this job done? Last comment. If we were to play back a tape of every conversation that you had this past week, oh, God forbid, but anyway. any rate, if we could play back a tape, if we could go to the Lord and say, okay, give me the tape on such and such, and we're going to play it back. And we're going to hear the conversations of one week. If you could hear your own conversations, what would you learn about yourself? What would you learn? Where are you at in all this? God hears it all the time. Our tongue displays who we are. It tells us and it, it changes the directions that we're going. It leads us. It can destroy everything we have, and it is a reflection of who we are. I hope you will leave tonight. Maybe you won't think anything about it, but I hope during the week the Holy Spirit will pull you aside, especially if, you, if you're real weak in this area, especially if you're real weak and you, you are not managing your mouth. I hope the Holy Spirit will pull you aside this week and just refresh your memory about the outline. I can't teach you anything, but the Holy Spirit sure can. And boy, he can recipe out exactly what you need. He can put your little, his thumb down on top of you and recipe out exactly what you need to conform you to the image of Christ. And as I look at all of Christendom, all the years, this is the area that we need more work in than any of them. It's our mouth. It's our mouth. And yet, I know, it's like, a, it's like a moot subject. I don't know why that is. Maybe the devil is just working on us and working on us and fighting with us. Would you work on it this week? Take the outline. Think about it. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you manage your mouth. It'll make Nebo Crossing the sweetest place in North Carolina. Let's stand together. Pianists will come. We'll just have a verse or two of invitation. I don't know where you're at on this. I'm not God. I'm just a message deliverer. I pray that, uh, you know, maybe the Holy Spirit spoke to you not. Maybe you need to apologize to somebody. Maybe the Holy Spirit just flashed it right in front of your mind. Oh, yeah, what I said to that person this week. You need to get that right. Maybe you need to go say, I'm sorry. Maybe you need to apologize to a family member, a spouse, or a child. I don't know. All I know is we've got, to, we've got to get and keep this in order. Managing our mouths. Anyone? Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for loving us, for your word. And I know this is a very teachy lesson. Sometimes it's necessary. I pray, God, you would speak to all of our hearts. Help us to be sweet like Jesus. Help us to be truthful and honest and have our source uh, like it ought to be so that our mouth says the right things. God bless your people. Pray for the teens tonight as they head to Florida. Speak to their hearts. Uh, give them traveling mercies. Bless our families here at Nebo Crossing. Um, may we honor you, especially with our mouth. In Jesus' name, amen.